You know, and it's funny when you had mentioned it and, and how it started was uh, I asked you and Cindy and I to be on a call because she's a publisher to kind of talk about the book series to put on a podcast I was running to put on on my website to promote it. And I didn't know whether you were serious or just being polite because Cindy said, oh, Danielle has such a nice voice. I was surprised that she, uh, you know, didn't record it herself. And, and I didn't have the time or energy to do it. Honestly, to me, it's easy to do just the female voices where you did the male voices and the main narration. So you had a much bigger project. I'm maybe 20, 25% of it. The rest of it is, is your recording. And anyway, when you made that offer to like record, for me to record the voices and put them together, like I, I thought maybe you were just being nice, but I was like, well, I'm just gonna ask them. <laughs> like, you know. What do you want? Hussein managed to choke out. What do you think I want, princess? The demon appeared almost offended. I want you to set me free. I thought we had. Lucine protested. Reverend Isabella sent you to another dimension. What happened? You know what happened, damn it! He growled before composing himself. Rev? Rev? He couldn't bring himself to say her name. Isabella's a hack! Instead of sending me to another dimension... All she did was trap me between the layers of this one. Danielle okay. Pye, it's good to see you. It's good to see you too. How are you? Good. How are things in Florida? Good. Yeah, feeling a little better. Uh, COVID starting to clear up. I was hoping by the time we had this third conversation that COVID would be no longer, but at least we're getting closer, I think, so... Yeah, um, we've got the vaccination rate up. I think the double double jab now is is it's in the eighty percent. So nice. Yeah, yeah, and the thing that annoys me is all along I've said the only way out of this is vaccination, and then we've got people who won't get vaccinated. Uh, what's that all about? So, and, and I don't mind if they say they've got a better way of getting out of this. Great, let's hear it. But to just go, nah, I don't want it. I don't get that. But. And unfortunately, we haven't even reached our 70%. And I, what I think that people don't understand is the virus has a chance to mutate and get worse. So yeah. that those of us who are vaccinated, the vaccine doesn't work as effectively. And then they yeah. say, oh, the vaccine doesn't work. It's like, well, it would have if everybody got on board from the beginning. So, yeah. Yeah. But never underestimate. Doing a better job. <laughs> uh, never underestimate the power of stupid people in large groups. I'm not sure who first said that, but <laughs> they can be a powerful force. Yeah, it's a shame the virus is smarter than most people. <laughs> it's certainly smarter than anti-vaxxers. Um, okay, <laughs> so as well as being known for an author and a narrator, you do so many things, uh, including multimedia specialist, positive psychology, health and wellness coach, health and wellness coach, a podcast producer, co-host. Uh, when someone meets you for the first time and they say, so what do you do? What do you say? <laughs> I usually try to keep it as simple as possible. I say a multimedia specialist. Um, I, you know, I, that's a cop out. I should say I'm a writer. But if you agree yes. with I'm a writer, everybody's like, oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> Nobody takes it seriously. So I tend, I find if I lead with multimedia content specialist, you know, and then go into author and then go into, and, and life coaching is another one. You say you're, you're a positive psychology coach or and they say, is it life coaching? Then they're like, oh, so I'm in a lot of fluffy fields, but yeah. if I use the word multimedia, then it gains a little bit of respect. Yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. And to just give a bit of background, I mean, we've covered this in the others, but anyone who's watching this for the first time, you're originally from Pennsylvania. And you grew up in a doomsday cult. Yes, thanks for mentioning that. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Do you, it's, it's, if that's a sore point, I'll move on. Um, it's it's just, but to me, I think it's I fascinating. Given, I haven't, I haven't been able to give you grief for months now. So, you know. <laughs> it's all bent up. Okay. Well, what defines a cult? Okay. 
there's going to be some striking similarities uh, between some of what we see happening in politics. A lot of people will draw parallels uh, sometimes to their own religion. I think some of the defining things are, number one, not being able to make decisions. Everything's decided for you, what you wear, what you eat. Um, even po politically, how you're supposed to vote, if you're supposed to vote, because we were not allowed to. Um, I would say there are a lot of demands for respect of the leader and you don't get to ask questions. So if I read something in the Bible, say, and I said, this doesn't align with what you're saying, you don't get to ask those questions. And you're usually chastised if you do. There's usually some kind of financial requirement. And that that's the only thing to this day. And can you hear me okay? Because I just realized I can't hear myself talking with these on. Okay, I can <laughs> so hear you perfectly. As, if I start lying at you, uh, if I start yelling at you, just okay. tell me to back off. <laughs> Be, feel, feel free to just take one off a little bit if that helps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I can look extra dorky. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I can create a look. Okay. That's a signature Danielle right there. I, I should okay. mention, I should, if anyone has just joined this, <laughs> at the very beginning of this, I was hearing a bit of an echo, and I said to Danielle, would you mind putting some headphones on just to stop that happening? <laughs> so um, Danielle is kind of wearing the headphones under protest at the moment, but uh, t to soften the blow, I decided to put some on so I looked the same. Yeah. So we either look really cool or really, you know. Yeah, one or the way. other, yeah. So anyway... Uh, the big thing was the finances. So my dad grew up in a very poor family, became a really good businessman, well off, could have sent us all to college, um, except that he gave it all to the cult. So I, the, my, I guess my leftover bitterness is having to work three jobs to pay my own way through school. I'm the only one of four kids who actually got their degree and then their higher degree, but that was all because I busted my butt <laughs> to do it. Um, not that my parents didn't help, but uh, so the financial investment, um, I think the emotional, the, another big one is everything in the family, like you don't talk about stuff to outsiders, right? So then if you end up leaving, and I am going to take one of these off so I can hear a little better. If you end up leaving said environment, then you kind of have been isolated, right? You're ostracized from that group. And yeah. then you're out here and you don't know anybody outside. So it's, you know. Now, is it a spectrum? Are there levels of those different defining, you know, because I reckon some people might feel like they work for a company that is run like a cult. And yeah. from personal experience, what you've just explained, a lot of those things would relate to certainly to my family there were certain things that weren't quite that you weren't allowed to question and there was a leader and all the rest of it and decisions were made for you um so did you grow up in a traditional religion can i ask or no um well i was christened as church of england which is protestant but we never went to church apart from weddings and christenings so no that wasn't part of it um no, at school they were, they made us sing hymns and we went to assembly and stuff at at school because gotcha. we don't have the separation of church and state here. So it was a state school, but you have Christianity uh, forced down your throat, um, <laughs> in, in particularly in primary school, you know, when that's when the indoctrination takes yeah. place. Yeah, but no, there was no religious... Um, element that my parents were religious they believed yeah, in god but you still have you still have those obligations um and if i go off on one of my tangents just bring me back because i happen to be researching some of church and state like throughout history for a course that i'm creating on on women throughout history um and aging and a lot of the rules that the church placed on women are basically stripping them of their rights you now see to this day, we're like fighting to get them back. So mm. even if somebody says, I wasn't brought up religious, they're going to feel it in, mm. in society because... Oh, it's yeah, because so many laws have been based on religious doctrine and dogma along the way, yes. haven't they? 
Yeah. So, so to answer your previous question, uh, I'm not an expert on cults. I would say that there are some that are worse than others. You know, I've told you there's, there's some that I've read about that I feel like my life was a walk in the park. And that's not to negate that I had some bad experiences, but I can recognize that there was some way worse stuff out there. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I do think there are different levels of it. Um, yeah. You know, we have some people, and you might agree that any religion is a cult. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of organized religion at all. And, and I, I don't know if we'd spoken about this before, but because we live in a very tolerant society, we have what I like to call the tolerance paradox, which is where if you are tolerant of someone else's religious views, but their, religious, their religious views yeah. suppress freedom, particularly for people like women, well then that's, that's not tolerance, is it? That's enabling. That is the tolerance paradox for me. And I think in some cases, we are way, well, in most cases, we are way, way too tolerant of all religions because, as far as I'm concerned, all religions are basically silly. I mean, the stuff that they believe is just stupid. And otherwise, rational, intelligent people buy into this thing and then we're not supposed to question it. In, you know, and in even me saying most religions are silly is a controversial thing to say when there's absolutely no fact or evidence to back any of this nonsense up. But, hey, I don't know. Maybe we I... We did have this conversation before we got into <laughs> a minor debate. <laughs> yes, did we? Well, maybe we should move away from that then. No, but that's okay. No, that's fine because, I mean, I like you. I am not a fan of organized religion. And you also know that... Sorry, I'm struggling with this. Um, I'm technically an interfaith minister, but I don't tell people that because I kind of fall in line more with, you know, Reverend Isabella in the book. Yes. Where she claims no religion. I don't claim a religion. I'm not a fan of organized religion. As far as the respect goes, my tolerance goes for, you know, if you're a good person, you don't hurt somebody else. You're not hurting yourself. I can respect that. You know, there are, there are lines that people cross, as you've mentioned, where I would have a hard time tolerating or respecting it. You know, I can respect, I try to respect the person. I try to respect people's beliefs, but I like, like you, I struggle with certain topics, particularly as you mentioned, like women's rights or, you know, we, we talked about this before, um, John is Hispanic. If I were still in that church, he and I could not be married. Really? Because, you know. In the Catholic Church? Well, no, we weren't Catholic. We were our own weird brand of Christianity. <laughs> Who? You, you and John? No, 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 no. Where I, when I grew up. You, the, 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 dooms, the, the, the doomsday, doomsday cult, cult yes. was its own brand of yes. religion. I, I see. And you would not have been a mar able to marry John because he's, he was from outside the cult. I see. Is that, that's it, right. Well, outside the, not just outside the cult. Uh, there's no interracial marriage at all. So he, because he's his family's from Cuba, Colombia, Spain, and I'm a white woman, we couldn't be married. Uh, who was it? Uh, it was one of the comedians. I think it's Patton Oswalt, the comedian, described it as, as a book club that got out of hand. <laughs> so Now, I'm curious. Yes. I'm going there. Do people ever, because I happen to know you're vegan, do people ever accuse you of that being your own brand of religion or belief system? Uh, they haven't, but they don't normally talk about it because I don't normally bring it up because I don't think it's one of the things that defines me. It's just that I, I think I know, I mean, I never used to be vegan. I've only been vegan for a few years. I was vegetarian for a few years before that. And before that, I was what I used to describe as a vegetarian. I'd only eat fish. Um, <laughs> um, but the more I found out about how we get things like milk and eggs, the more I was appalled at, you know, how it all comes about. And I don't normally get into a conversation with anyone about it because I knew before I knew what went on, I quite happily would eat, eat eggs and milk, you know, but, you know, but when you find out that milk, it starts with rape, <laughs> you know, that's how milk starts. M milk starts with a cow being artificially inseminated against its will. Then it gives birth to a, 
a calf, which is either killed straight away or taken away to be turned into veal, and then it lives for two to three years before it just drops and dies and becomes burgers, when a normal cow would live like 20 odd years and something. It's just horrific. And this is all for milk when, you know, you can have oat milk. So I suppose I, I, I would say I have never been accused of that. But if you were to ask me what is the closest thing I would have to a religion, it wouldn't be veganism. It would be Liverpool Football Club <laughs> because that is completely irrational. That love of that football club that I have is, you know, if you look at the, the facts, why is Liverpool better than any other club? To me, it's obvious. Um, but then when you look for the evidence, there is evidence, you know, through the history and the heritage of the club. But uh, and I, I secretly wonder if everybody who supports any other club secretly wishes they were a Liverpool fan, but through an accident of birth, it didn't happen. It, it is completely irrational, but it is very, very important to me. And, you know... So you worship the god of Liverpool football club. Well, if I go, if, <laughs> if I go to a match... That is a. I have a, a spiritual experience at the beginning of the match when we all sing "You'll Never Walk Alone," and I, many times I've been in tears when we've sung the song. I cried my eyes out in Istanbul when we won the European Cup when I was there, um, which is because it's the highest prize you can win in football. And it's been so long since we'd we'd won it. Um, it really it, it is. A, you know, because you have to have a spiritual element to, to religion. I don't get that from veganism. <laughs> I just think that's the right and obvious thing to do. But uh, Liverpool Football Club, that 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 is, to me, the closest. I think I get from that what religious people get from religion. Because, you know, although religious people believe in, in crazy nonsense, that a lot of the time hurts other members or, or removes the freedom of other members of society at least they have some kind of comradeship being in that club. Well, I get that from Liverpool as well. So all the things I think that, that people get from religion, I, gonna, I get I from being a fan. I was about that. Yeah, I was going to ask what the benefit, and it sounds like that you, you have the tradition, you have the social connectedness over a common belief system. So yes, and it, the history. I'm not saying yeah. it's a, right, I'm not saying it's a religion, but in terms of belief systems in general, that kind of fits the bill and a lot of people turn to religion for the social connection yeah so i i get it and as yeah. i said i'm not a fan of organized religion myself either so yeah I, I wouldn't argue that point um but i do think i i tend to believe in some metaphysical things that you would think were totally wacky like what for sure we've talked about it <laughs> Yeah, you like oh, yeah. like I I do not believe in life after death, or that can people can communicate with people after death, and and I think you're a bit yes, more open minded so, than me. So you think when you so you think when you die you just die. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you think, uh, from a scientific standpoint, that you die and your energy is comes back as something else, like grass or air or? Like is well, like if you, I, I believe scientifically, if you're buried and you you rot away, and the worms, you know, you get turned into the energy that drives the worm along that ate what was you. In that way, I I think that the energy can be transferred, but not as this thing having this soul as an energy mm -hmm. that moves on. I think that's just it. I have no I have no evidence. I've seen no evidence of people returning from the dead or there being anything okay. going on there this and i i would probably argue politely because i like you that <laughs> there if if there probably was evidence but you are not going to be open to it oh you know, no if there were if there was undisputable evidence well i would have to cop it sweet and go wow because really wouldn't <laughs> it be great if this is not all there is yeah it and would I be don't great know after this you know i don't know if there's reincarnation the way people think of it but i also believe in parallel worlds so i think we could be having this conversation from multiple different locations um you know so don't go by me because i go out there <laughs> mm. now we've touched oh, no. on quite a few things <laughs> to try and get to the background of you and i've done that deliberately because a lot of things that you touch on in the books now the books are called the data collectors and in the book, you cover quite a lot of ground. Considering this is a science fiction book, or these are science, this is a science fiction trilogy, you do 
cover some of the issues we have just gone over. You talk about different layers or parallel universes. You talk about um, the suppression of freedom through either sexism or any of the isms, you know. But then you even go further on to gender equality and relationships and racism. and It's all in there. So just talk Cleverly to me. disguised as aliens. <laughs> well, just I don't know where you want to start with this because the, this is a this is a big topic. The things that you you cover in the books, the areas you address. Do you want to talk about them? Yeah, and I guess where I would start is, you know, because and, and a lot of this is coming to light. People having read the book and they're reading things into it that I didn't even necessarily intend. So when I wrote the book, I just wanted to tell a good story. And a good story has characters that aren't all like me. That's boring. I wanted some diversity. So, and I didn't want to cherry pick the diversity. If you ever watch a, a TV show where they have basically a token everybody represented, I wasn't trying to do that. I was like, well, let me just pick some interesting people and have them do interesting things. And it wasn't until the book was nearly done where I started to see the parallels like, oh, I kind of have you know, the Vitruvians, they're shapeshifters. They could be considered like a transgender couple. I think it'd you know, be very have... cool. Uh, and Julie mentioned this when I was talking to Julie about, I'm talking to Danielle. I said, her books are amazing because they cover all these different things. And I said, the Vitruvians, you know, they're shapeshifters and uh, 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 they could be could be seen as like transgender. And Julie said, wouldn't it be cool, cool if transgender people described themselves as shapeshifters? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be a much cooler title than transgender? That would be. And maybe they would get more acceptance. Yes, I'm a shapeshifter. (laughs) But, you know, the point is I I actually started, you know, listing them out in the think book that I mentioned, just kind of like taking notes. Like I didn't realize all the themes were there. Some were intentional. Yes. Um, You know, I, I intended to have, like, for example, Commander Royce is an older gray woman who's small. Yeah. And I purposely wanted her to be a woman. I wanted even the smaller characters like Pelomar, who comes across as very goth and he's working in a costume shop. And you probably assume that he's gay based yeah. on where he's working and his presentation. And then, of course, he falls head over heels for a woman yeah. <laughs> who yeah. happens to be a shapeshifter. So, um, yeah, I, I, I did not intend to make a statement I didn't intend on for the most part, except in like some of those uh, few instances. It's just kind of how I live my life. And I do th- expect by the recent one star review that I got with no explanation <laughs> that there is probably going to tick some people off because people are going to read this as soon as you mentioned, I purposely, um, talked about the environment and climate change. Yes. And while I, you know, while I'm not a vegan, I believe in mostly plant-based for health. I believe that if we lived like our ancestors did, to your point and, you know, the cow just <laughs> through natural means was producing milk, there there's just our overproduction damages our environment, it hurts us and of course as you know the way you feel as far as the way animals are treated. All that being said is just this is just how I view my life and I can see people looking at that as like oh yeah you're a liberal this you're li-. and I, I don't even consider I don't claim a political part I'm very you know don't claim a religion I don't claim a political party I'm very wishy-washy <laughs> but uh it you basically know, means you're more open you're not closed off because particularly in the United States I've noticed not that I've been there much lately, but when I have been there, that people do tend to treat politics the way I treat Liverpool Football Club, and they just cheer for their team, no matter what happens. You're with us or you're against us, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and that's not a healthy way to be. I mean, it is if you support Uh, Liverpool, obviously, because that's the way things should be. But with politics, which is something very important... You can't just go, yeah, what What do you think? Well, what do our side think? Yeah, that's what I think. That means you don't think. <laughs> yeah. And most, a good portion of our friends, regardless of where they stand, um, 
I have a friend named Julie and she always describes herself as left of center. And I was like, you know, that kind of makes sense to me. I do think I'm a little more progressive, but I don't automatically vote one side or another. Um, and unfortunately, like I said, people are going to read this because you're either with us or against us. And because a lot of these social issues have become political issues, you know, I expect the backlash. Right. But you you didn't set out to write three books that covered these areas because you thought they were important for people to, to think about. You know, for instance, uh, climate change, which is in there. Yeah. Okay. So, so there were specific ones like climate change. Yes, I did want to mention it and hope, and I wanted to do it in a way that was hopefully not heavy handed. Yeah. Um, I did want to talk about like some women's issues. I did a little bit as far as non-traditional roles for people that I've mentioned where, you know, where you have a commander who's a woman, like whenever I had, and I had a, a Dr. Willa as a woman. So whenever I could take a role that was typically a particular gender, I tried to switch it up on purpose. Yeah. So there were, so I, I'm not going to say that there, there wasn't some intention there. It just, I didn't set out to kind of check off a list of all the things that I'm going to protest. That's not what, you know, what I set out to do. It was just interesting that it rose a lot of issues. Like for example, um, when in the, in the first book, when Lucine is standing in the grocery store and somebody starts talking about the illegal aliens, they're talking about actual aliens from another planet. But as I'm <laughs> writing it, I was like, well, we kind of say that about immigrants. So yes. it, it uh, so there were social issues that, like I said, I wasn't trying to necessarily be political, but it sort of got woven into the story. Some of it was probably subconscious. So I would say maybe 25% was intentional and the rest just sort of happened. <laughs> right. Well, what about the one in the, I think it was the second book, where Lucine, the main character, she has a relationship with a Vitruvian called Dallin. Dallin is a Vitruvian, isn't he? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, he's but a Vitruvian. He's not a shapeshifter. He's, yes, that's right. He's yeah. in a higher class. He's, a, he's in a higher class, and he's in a ve very male-dominated environment, and he takes her to the embassy club. And the embassy club has certain restrictions on, on who can go. And he's kind of he's kind of trying to make her feel special because she's been allowed in, which only yeah. winds her up even more uh, and grates on her. That must have been a deliberate one, mustn't it? That that was not yeah. a subconscious one. And, yeah, I would say because that was a really, really good thing when that yeah. when that came up i thought oh this is really yeah. danielle's really getting not, into this yeah yeah i you know i tried to tried to pick my battles and that was deliberate because i think a lot of women don't necessarily see it um they're you know and I, without getting into current news stories people don't necessarily see abuse that's like right in front of them well i don't and, know about i don't know about i don't know much about golf but i know in this country, there are certain golf clubs where women can't play on Saturday mornings. Really? Yeah. I and I that. and I always think, well, why would any woman belong to that club? Why? Yeah. But they do. And they can't. I think it's a Saturday. There's one there's one weekend. That could be a Sunday. I think it's a Saturday, though, a Saturday morning that women that's that's men only that thing. Is and there a day for for women? only? I don't think so. But like I say, I don't know much about golf, but. It's one of the things that puts me off golf because I don't get, I just don't understand golf. I don't understand that people. That used to either. annoy me in New York for the opposite reason because New York, when I lived there, you know, back in the 90s was supposed to be so progressive. And yet, if you went to a nightclub, <laughs> they let the well-dressed young women in first. Or for free so often. Have to wait in, yeah. And like the guard would actually go down the line and like look you over and decide who gets to go in first. Yeah. Um, you know, because and, and usually the women get to go in first because they assume that's going to draw the men in to buy them drinks. So I think so that's I a business. I think that, that I think that's actually a business decision, though, because if a club is known for having a lot of hot women then a lot more men will go. And in theory, maybe men spend more money there. I don't know. That might be a more a business thing than a prejudice thing. I don't know. I think the golf one's just Either pure way, prejudice. It's terrible. I, I, no, it's no, of course, <laughs> the results the same. But the motivation 
is a little less sinister than perhaps uh, just a, yeah. just an outright ban where it would affect business because they will make less money if they if they've uh, excluded half of their membership i would have thought whereas the Probably. the one with the nightclubs it might be they make more money by doing it that i don't know i'm oh, not yeah. condoning it i'm just oh, saying I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well you do cover a lot a lot of ground particularly with prejudice which which brings me on to this which is slightly off the books we'll get back to the books in a second that's fine um i watched a video this morning when i was looking forward to talking to you and it was called why should you stop giving this comp why you should stop mm -hmm. giving this compliment on youtube mm -hmm. and i was like wow and it like hit me between it's the, the eyes. It's the one where the women are sitting and there's, they start saying for your age, for your age. And then they start saying, you know, well, what it is for anyone who hasn't seen, for yeah. anyone who wasn't, and I yeah. recommend you do see it. Why you should, why you should stop giving this compliment mm -hmm. on YouTube, Daniel Pai. Uh, it's a very, uh, very, very well-made video, very high production standards, way better yeah. than what we're doing right now. I, right, no, I put it, I actually promote that one. I know what you're talking about because I put it on uh, sites where I do social media and I put it on mine probably once every six months. Yeah, I retweeted I, 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 it I straight exactly. away. And and yeah. so it, it shows uh, some uh, a range of women of various ages. Uh, they just seem to be typical women. That doesn't seem to be anything that connects them other than they are women. And they are asked to, they're, they're shown a photograph of another woman and asked to put something before the phrase for her age. So I think the first one is that it's Jennifer Aniston and the lady says she has nice skin or something for her age. And someone says she's sexy for her age or uh, and they show the one of Cher from the video, the famous video. Uh, turn back time and say she's she's dressed inappropriately yeah. for her age yeah. and then you flash up slogans which say things like uh, she's funny for an Asian mm -hmm. or she, and then you're like whoa and then suddenly these women realize that that prejudice against age yeah. you know to be told that Cher is inappropriate for her age and you think about that and you go, well, you could say, you know, dressed like that is inappropriate for a primary school teacher. <laughs> but for her age, she's in show business, for goodness sake. She's selling records. What's the big yeah, deal? You know, why are we so judgy? Yeah. But that one seems to almost be the last taboo. You know, now that we have gay marriage, you know, Black Lives Matter, all these other things, the age one does seem to be the last taboo, doesn't it? Yeah, it's that, 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 that is allowed. The, uh, the last it's taboo the last that's accepted. Yeah, last yeah, acceptable. Last acceptable stereotype. Yeah. So in my work with, um, as you know, Masterpiece Living, and one of their their big things is fighting ageism, and they say it's the last form of acceptable, the last stereotype that's acceptable, an acceptable form of discrimination, and they they've even and I've worked with them for probably eleven years now, and they have this litmus test. So if you can take that end out and replace it with you know sh you know sh as you mentioned she looks good for a jew yeah for a black woman yeah or a whatever if you can replace it with a fat woman yeah 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 you can replace it with any kind of ethnicity religious background um physical qualities sexual preference you know and it's inappropriate then there's a good chance that it's inappropriate if it's for your age <laughs> Yeah, it's exactly the same kind of yeah. prejudice. Yeah. I get really annoyed too, you know, when you look at if you go to the birthday card aisle, everything over age 30 and 40 is over the hill and all these jokes about everything falling apart. And unfortunately, and I see this, I, I watch a lot of late night comedy, not late night, usually on YouTube where, where you watch the clips and they're always talking about this grandpa and this old man and, and it it really bothers me that people get pigeonholed like that and it's it's interesting for me because when I started say working with Masterpiece I was in my 30s now I'm 49 and I'm starting to to experience and notice more myself in you know it's just as I age and coming to terms with it so yeah it's, yeah oh it's, it's very real you know it's very real I you know in, in, even in 
in broadcasting in radio you know i worked uh, uh, used to work on a lot of top 40 stations i'm actually now yeah. too old to work on a top 40 station now i get that huh. you know, they want people who can relate to the target demographic a younger target demographic that they're aiming at and i don't do the things that 20 year olds do now i get that that gets back to it being a business decision but i can remember being at one um commercial radio station and i hadn't been there very long and i had at the time i had years of experience on the radio in australia and many years of experience in the uk and i was only in my I think I was in my mid 30s or mid to late 30s at the time but there was a young guy Hi Bagheera, and there was a there was a young guy who came along who really it was I think it was like his second radio job and he really wasn't even that good but boy did they push him because there's just this this um striving for that the, they people get almost hypnotized by youth and i read an article about this about entrepreneurs and young entrepreneurs seem to find it easier to get backing from you know get money and, and backing for their latest idea than older entrepreneurs do because people want to go with the young guy you know and because they assume that the older people don't know technology They're yeah but but how old trend, was steve jobs when he invented the iphone I mean, he was yeah. he was over 40. He was probably he could have been over 50 for all I know. You know, I have two funny, quick examples to relate to what you just said. And I don't know the inventor's name, but there's the genius bar where you go. I think it's if for, that's for Apple for Apple. Yeah, where one of the original developers. And again, I don't remember his name for the computer actually in his retirement thought well maybe i'll go help out at one of these genius bars brilliant and he applied and they turned him down because he was too old <laughs> and of course he did what i would have done and went to the media and said the guy who invented this why you geniuses have your job you just turned him down because of ageism yeah so um in in my my friend and publisher cindy who you met when she in this was probably going back maybe 15 20 years she had the opportunity to work for she eventually got hired but for a fortune 500 like a top tech company she interviewed five times she tested above all the men and at the end they were pushing this other guy because he was a man and they said to her we've never put a woman in this position yeah and the other guy had like three qualifications to her 10 and yeah. she, they made that. So they actually flew her out to California to interview like two more times than they wouldn't have made the man. She eventually got the job, but she had to like fight for it because, well, women don't know technology. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the same used to happen in, in radio. I mean, most of the radio stations I worked at, they would only have one female on the air. And I know I heard stories from from girls who I know girls. That sounds horrible. From from women who I know in broadcasting who would try and get into a radio station and would be told by the program director, "We already have a woman on the air." Wow. <laughs> and some were <laughs> oh. some some were even told, "Oh no, the research shows that women don't like listening to women on the radio," and no such research exists. No such research exists. And it became one of those lies that was repeated enough that people believed it. That, that radio stations that were targeted at 25 to 54-year-old female demographics w w would tell women broadcasters, no, women don't want to listen to women on the radio. And it was completely false. And it, it, they got away with it for years. It's changed a bit now. But you're yeah. still dealing with that kind of thing. So th there is prejudice everywhere against you know the, the sexism and the ageism one i i always wonder as well elizabeth holmes is on trial right now would she have managed to con all those people out of all that money if she was a 50 year old woman when she did it i don't think she would i think it was because she was young i think she was what she was probably less than 30 wasn't she when she started her crooked business you know if i'm being honest i don't know that story you're, you're referring elizabeth to. holmes she's in court right now um she she set up a company i think it's called theranos i think i've got the name there she she mm -hmm. she was an mit dropout and she um 
She set up a business where she didn't like getting having blood taken for tests. So she set up a business where, from a pin prick of blood, they could put it through the, a machine called the Edison machine, and it would um, it would analyze your blood for for everything, for all the cancers, or you know, in one go. And it was fake. It didn't work. And uh, she managed to get money out of really important people like Rupert Murdoch put millions into it. And, wow. and if, yeah, if she's found guilty of fraud, she will go to jail for over 20 years. And th that course is that is an ongoing court case in the USA right now. Um, if, it, if, if this was an ongoing court case in the UK right now, it, what I've just said would be contempt of court. We have very, very strict contempt of court rules. I wouldn't be able to say that. In Britain, I can say it because it's an American case, and you don't have the same contempt of court rules. Yeah, but yeah, that's a, that's an aside, right? So you do manage to cover some big stuff in the Data Collectors trilogy. So start off then. You did you write all three books first, or did it go book, audio book, book, audio book, book, audio book? It was, well, when I did the first book, this was interesting. I didn't even occur to me to do an audio book. So it was the, it was just the, the print and the ebook. And it just so happened that John and I, during the pandemic, we wanted to get away. So we decided we couldn't fly anywhere. Um, we decided to take the dog with us, go to a cabin in the woods to be away from people, but still be out of our house. And so he happened to put on an audio book one of Terry Pratchett's novels. And the guy was so, had all these character voices and was so entertaining for our drive that I was like, you know, I should do that. Can you remember who it was and that did the narration? I can look it up. It was, I think the, the book was Soul Music by Terry Pratchett. Um, so I don't, I can look it up and see who the narrator is. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but it was just, I, it was so fun to listen to it that way. You know, and I, I didn't realize how fun they could be. I just thought it was somebody reading the dry reading of. Was books. he British? So as he was British, see, maybe it put it in my head. <laughs> Who knows? That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I was yeah, I was going to find it. Well, let me know who it is, and I'll send him a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but what was so surreal, as as you know, we did the second and third books, um, and as a co narration. And then I decided, well, I think it should be consistent. So I went and did the voices for the first one. And it was really weird. I'm picking up the original draft. And I, the last time I actually had fished it out of my the desk drawer was when I was looking at it like, is this thing ever going to get published? So it was really weird to double back now that there are like three books in every format. Um, so after the first one, I, I did consciously figure it was going to be all three formats but it didn't start off that way. But did you write the three books as written books first together, or did you write each one and then after and after the last one came out? How did that process work? Like, did you know oh, where okay. you were going? When you were writing page one, chapter one of book one, did you know what the final chapter of book three would be about? If I were a better writer, I would know. Not necessarily. <laughs> I, had a, I, had a, I had intended on one book. Okay. And then as I got about three quarters of the way through, I'm like, there, there's no way I can wrap this up in a neat little bow. And I read books like a, a mystery or whatever, and you get to the end and on the last two pages, they give this giant exposition and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened at the end. And yeah. I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. So I, I wrapped up the, the story arc with the idea that I would come back and I apologize, Bagheera keeps trying to steal my tea. <laughs> Uh, and he made me lose my train of thought sorry but so I didn't know where it was going to go I had a rough idea what I wanted to cover in book two and then once I got into book two the characters started rebelling because I had some definitive ideas like Roman for example turned out to be quite a bit different and I don't want to give too much away no no spoilers here but there were certain characters that I had decided at the beginning of book three were not going to live. Wow. And But I loved them too much, so I couldn't kill them. Okay. <laughs> so I had to kill other people instead. <laughs> <laughs> 
So a lot of the a lot of times the characters and the plots kind of changed because as I mentioned, and this was it's kind of a learning process. One of the the biggest complaints about book number one is people found the timeline confusing. Like unless you read the header that said before the assembly, after the assembly, where it gave you some kind of where you were in space, people didn't know the timeline. And so that kind of confused people. So by book two and three, I still wrote out of order, but I tried to make it a little more seamless and more chunks in the same timeline without a flashback. Right, I, don't I know see. If I answered your question. No, you you did. You kind of you did them as as you went. So you didn't think of an audio book and, until you got the book. So then I auditioned for the first one, and I got the first one. And and you mentioned it earlier. I did all the characters, male and female. So then you and I had a chat on one of these um, video things, YouTube, and you mentioned I can't remember whether it was during the chat or after the chat. Um, that you'd like to do the female characters. And I said, yeah, cool, let's do that with the next one. So that's what we did. And then we did the, the third one that way with you in Florida and me 35 miles north of London. <laughs> and that worked out. And so then we went back and did the, but you did all the graft on the, uh, on the first one again. You're the one put it all together. Because on those two, you sent me your female voices and I edited yeah. them with my session but on the third one, you did it the other way, whereas I sent... Oh, no, you already had my no. voices recorded from the first one. From the, the, what first, I'm talking, one. From the yeah. first one. You already had my voice recorded, and you went and you inserted your voice. That must have been a big job. Uh, that, yeah, that was a pain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did the... <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you did the other two. You know, and it's funny when you had mentioned it and, and how it started was uh, I asked you and Cindy and I to be on a call because she's a publisher to kind of talk about the book series to put on a podcast I was running to put on on my website to promote it. And I didn't know whether you were serious or just being polite because Cindy said, oh, Danielle has such a nice voice. I was surprised that she, uh, you know, didn't record it herself. And, and I didn't have the time or energy to do it honestly to me it's easy to do just the female voices where you did the male voices and the main narration so you had a much bigger project i'm maybe 20 25 percent of it the rest of it is, is your recording and anyway when you made that offer to like record for me to record the voices and put them together like i i thought maybe you were just being nice but i was like well i'm just gonna ask them <laughs> like you know, were you serious because the second one's done <laughs> yeah and you and you missed the opportunity to say no <laughs> it's it is a lot more work but the result makes it more than worth it the result to have you as the female characters particularly i and i think i said this last time particular and i know you this might sound insulting and i hope not because i know you worked really hard on some of the more exotic characters and lucine is 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 pretty straight for me having you as lucine kind of holds it together i think you know because she's the constant main character through it and to have you doing that rather than me doing my interpretation of a female uh, from Florida when you are actually a female who lives in Florida. It just, it, j uh, uh, for me, that was it. But then it is wonderful having you do all the other characters as well. How did you find that? Did you enjoy it? Because that, for, for me, that's oh, one of the, yeah. doing audio books, for me, finding the characters and then performing them is some of my favorite stuff because that's just like yeah. playing there's no there's a lot there's a lot of work you know when you get into the editing stage and the all, all the other bits of pieces there's actual or it could be described as actual work but just doing crazy characters is just fun you know did you oh, enjoy it, it? yeah oh absolutely you know I, i've mentioned this before I, you know i come from a theater background but i never liked being on stage and having people pay attention and watch what I was doing. To me, that was very intimidating. So this to me was scratching like the acting itch to be able to record in a studio, nobody's around. And if you mess up, you can just do it again. Not even an engineer because um, so you self up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so literally no one is around. Fun. 
And I ended up, because I wanted the voices to be distinct, you know, I didn't have time to become an expert in all these different voices, but I did purchase some different accents just to kind of get a flavor for if somebody is deep in the throat or if they're raspy, um, if they're rolling their tongue a certain way or even like their pronunciations from the back of the throat versus the roof of their mouth. And so I would, when I knew certain characters were coming up, I would try to like go through a couple of hours of these training just till I got the character the way I wanted it to sound. And then if the course said, well, this accent doesn't talk that way, I could ignore it because I wasn't trying to be authentic. I just wanted to make sure that they were distinct. Um, the problem was I would float in and out of character like, so in, in book three, when I sent you the chapters, I would, I would record and I'd say chapter three, and then I'd go do the voices. Well, somewhere in the middle, the chapters became chapter three, and then I start, started with all these different voices, and I'm like, wait, this is just to let Graham know what chapter I'm on. So I find myself like slipping into the wrong voice. It was very strange. Oh, it's good fun. I'm, I'm trying to think throughout the whole series, I think you only gave me one bit of direction on a character. The rest, you just left it up to me. So I was like, uh, can, can you remember which yeah. one that was? Yeah, so I, I tried to give some guidance, but I didn't know how much to give you. And so other than Ivan being Viking-esque, I could kind of hear his voice in my head. Um, and well, I just made him Scottish. Cepheus, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Cepheus was much more like a, a, a deeper, like Benedict Cumberbatch kind of deep. Oh, you voice, did actually. No, there's softer. two. You did mention the Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. That is one. Yeah. There's. there's so there then, are two um, real direct. Uh, yeah. I think. Yeah. So I think I gave a a little bit. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. I don't think I did for any of the female characters, but for the men. Um, the one I'm thinking of, you still haven't mentioned, and it's the one that stuck with me because it made it make so much more sense and made it so much easier for me. Which one? Jasper Set. Oh, okay. You oh, yeah, said... yeah, because he he I he didn't sound in my head like Jack Nicholson, but he was so over the top. <laughs> I just pictured Jack Nicholson in like the Batman movie at the Penguin, and I was like, yeah. So that so it gave you some guidance of, of how yeah to make him. So I just yeah. okay, Jack Nicholson uh, in the in the Batman, the Joker, wasn't it? You said Bat as yeah. the Joker in Batman. Oh, sorry, sorry, Joker. Yeah, I and I seen went that movie in so long, and I went okay, I've got that. So that was that was how I didn't do a Jack Nicholson impression but I did you know I gave him this you know he's yeah. like that and so uh, it was and, like and, yeah it was good and in good revisiting the, the characters were a lot of fun like I I, uh, I really like the way you developed Roman because he sounds kind of suave and sophisticated and I liked how you made Far sound like almost like lechy but trying to sound good like a, a bad person trying to sound good like i really liked yeah the problem with the far was because far is a gay character i didn't want to do uh, you know an insulting typical showbiz gay yeah. character you know i had to be very careful i find i have to be very careful with that and very careful with with asians and indians because yeah. you can just come across as racist uh, and homophobic yeah. if you're not careful. So, so, the, so there are actually more of a challenge because it has to be a lot more subtle because you have to find out more about who the character is rather than their ethnicity yeah. or sexual orientation. Uh, you just have to and go a bit further. You, and with him, you only know because they got into a relationship. Like So, so to me, uh, I would assume that Mallory was probably gay in Mallory of the costume shop. Yes, but definitely. But I didn't want to write. I didn't want to write him that way. It's like yeah. let me just write him the way he is and let people draw their own conclusions. In fact, I never say even like Isabella. I'll say she has dark skin. I never say that she's Caribbean or she's black. Or, yeah. Like I purposely left out labeling anyone as a particular race because. Number one, you know, we end up on another planet anyway, so it doesn't matter. But I, I just didn't feel like it. If you just describe what the person looks like, you don't need to call it out necessarily. Yeah, the Mallory one was interesting because he, he, you know, he runs a costume shop, and so f for him, I went to some people who I've met in show business, uh, yeah. who because they're in show business, they come across very camp, but they're not gay. And I've met quite a few people like that. Um, 
uh, in my time. And so I gave it, he became one of those. Like someone who would work as a dresser or a costume designer. When I've done uh, TV commercials, I've met people from that kind of area. And they're not gay, but they are so camp for want of a better expression yeah. and so show busy and fabulous you know so that was <laughs> that was how i made mallory yeah yeah did you find so i found that some of the characters after i created them i was like what was i thinking because they were hard to to hold up and and be consistent with and i'd find them kind of slipping in and out you know if i had endless time i probably would have gone through the book and read each voice by itself because once you get on a roll it's easy but as soon as you put it down and walk away and come back it's hard to get back into that voice and the few chapters where there's four women talking to each other i was like oh. <laughs> you know it and it, but it was it was actually fun practice trying to you know going from one to the other and as i mentioned you know, at the beginning of this it was just it was a ton of fun um some characters i didn't plan some i intentionally would try to plan and some just sort of came out <laughs> Did you experience, I don't know if you experienced that in some of your creations where you just think of a character and the voice comes out without you trying? Uh, a little bit, but usually when, I, when a new character comes up, I have to stop. And then I have to read ahead quite a bit and find out what that character goes through quite early on. And I may even read a couple of chapters just to, that, that they've got that character in. And then I'll go back to the place where I stopped. And then I'll try a few different voices out until I get a comfortable one. But often I'll, I will record a character and then I'll get like five or six chapters in and I'll go back and I'll re-record every line because I know I've got it wrong. That that happens quite a lot yeah. because what you get to know them a bit more as yeah. as you see them, how they deal in certain situations. But I try and read it, but often I'll go back. But I always, once I've got that first first decent line that they say... I then save that in a file, a voices file for that book. And that character then has that line. So that if they disappear, and I do that with, even if it's like a doorman or a, or, or a bartender or just a small character, I will record a piece of their, uh, that first line and uh, record it and put it in a file so that if they show up again later in the book, yeah. then I can listen back to that if I've forgotten, I've gone like, I can't remember Dorman number three at the embassy club or something. I can go back and hear them again. Yeah. And, and then it's them. Um, I learned that yeah. very early on when I, the, I, in the first time travel book I did for someone, I learned that because there was somebody got served in a coffee shop and they had a conversation with the server and I thought, well, they're never going to come up again. There was someone in a coffee shop. And then sure enough, towards the end of the book, they go back to like, 10 minutes before then in the same coffee shop so yeah. it has to be exact and i had to go back and listen to the actual audio so now i take a a little clip do you do that did yeah. you take a clip of each character I, so you can play I, something I did back not i actually had for for book two i printed out and i would write little notes like for for commander royce that she pronounces her d's like t's and uh -huh. there were certain cues or or um is, uh, Isabella has to go roll up. She starts under pitch and goes up. So I write myself little notes and then, uh, so I'd remember. And then there's some practice because you forget. So I would go, you know, I didn't actually go back and record and listen now that I'm, I'm trying to think if I, I did that. I don't think I did. I just think I tried to kind of go back and recreate the character in my mind. The weird thing, we talked about this before, is certain characters, like, I would actually have to do whatever motion to yeah. get into their voice. Yeah. And some of them were just weird. Like, Kiki came out of my mouth, and I didn't even have to do anything with her. She was just there. And I didn't I didn't practice her or anything. But you gave her that I lisp, did, which was nice with her. Which was, I didn't plan on it. It just sort of happened. And then um, I needed another voice for Amy. And I was like, I just opened my mouth and she came out and I was like, okay, you'll do. And I like, I did not plan her at all. She just sort of, and I was like, okay. Um, versus some of the other ones that I had to consciously try to get accurate. And sometimes I, it, it failed miserably. Like Royce would go from sounding German to sounding Russian to sounding like Israeli. Oh, really? Because she sounded <laughs> she sounded quite consistent to me whenever Commander Royce came up. She, yeah. yeah. Well, she took she took a lot of re-records. Right. Okay. <laughs> that's for sure. That's pretty. That's yeah. pretty clever though that you did because I don't think I could do it with a lot of the 
what I would call the, the minor characters, the major characters, you kind of get into the flow of doing them. But the more minor ones that only come up every now and again, I often have to go back and listen to that first line again and then got it. You could do it. You could store I them all upstairs. Uh, well, I think it helps because when I write them, I can, you know, they, they did. Some of them came out different than how I had intended when I wrote them. Like Fatima had a very musical voice. She did not come out talking like Brooklyn. <laughs> but, but once they were there, I yeah, I think probably because I created them. I, yes. I think you know them better. As a lesson learned, I would for the next book that I'm doing, I which there's not nearly as many characters, I don't think. Um, I would do I would probably follow that suggestion because I, I would have a little more direction as to what they should sound like. Like this was a little bit flying by the seat Book two was flying by the seat of my pants, and book three was like, let me see if I can, you know, craft this a little better. And then by the time I went back to book one, I thought, oh, this will be easy. There's only Lucene and Fatima, and I forgot, you know, there's a lady at the bar, and this, you know, there's all these little characters you forget are there. Yeah, they're so. the one. They're the trickiest of all, because you don't spend as much time working out because they're only a minor character, so you don't you, you don't go as big with them. And they're the ones that recur later on, although you know they're coming back. So um, you've got a bit of an advantage there. You know, sometimes yeah. you don't know they're coming back, though. Like Zenny, oh, of course, I thought yeah. she was the most, she was so annoying. To me, she was so annoying. I was like, she's going to get a minor role in book two, and then I'm going to get rid of her. And then I realized in book three, I kind of needed her. And she, she's a character that I disliked that grew on me. <laughs> she wore you down. And then I realized, I was like, you know what? At 17 years old, I was probably just like her. And I, and I was damn annoying. <laughs> no, they're great fun, though. They are, they are so much fun to do. And they're great books. And although I know you didn't write them with a deliberate message, there are messages in there on, on different social themes and... No, they're just wonderful. I was talking to Julie about them tonight, you know, just saying, you know, how uh, how interesting they are and, and, and how the characters interact together. So, upcoming projects. You mentioned a new book you're working on. Is this the mystery? Yes. So, I had set out, as I had mentioned to you, I was originally going to work on a kid's meditation book to round out a series I started more than a decade ago. And I sat down to write that, and instead I started writing the mystery. And this came about because I was having a really bad day. And I had gotten like a, you know, a, a, now it doesn't phase me because it's all, I, I realize it's subjective. And, you know, I had gotten a three-star review on the second book. And it was like right out of the gate. And I was like, you know, having that moment of, I'm a terrible writer. What was I thinking? Who do I think I am writing this? And then I full on pity party. And I think it was like COVID stress of being under lockdown and people I know being sick. And there was just a whole bunch of, in essence, I was having a crappy day. So I sat down and I just started writing about this character having a crappy day. And I got like 1200 words in and I was like, I could do something with this. So, so that, so then from that came Rue Brennan and her name basically, her, she's named after, uh, Rue is in like Rue the day. Um, so her name is basically based on discontent. The meaning of her name is is discontent. So I started writing about this discontented character. But then I started writing other characters around her and then the mystery sort of evolved. And that was so it really started with day. it started with character, not story. It started with a character and I, I just sat down and I was and I went back to because I used to live in a really tiny studio apartment in New York and I even looked it up to get kind of the specs to to remind myself what it looked like and I remember when I lived in in the Lower East Side I was on Allen and Delancey and I used to for some reason I loved to climb out on the fire escape and sit there and like people watch and so the character ends up going out on the fire escape and then I create her upstairs neighbor coming down and the conversation they have and then out of it kind of sprang this story. And so then I started to kind of deliberately write around it. And it and so far, it's really weird. The, the only reason I'm not further in it 
is because I'm trying to basically we were finishing up this series and I was going back to record book one, but I am 26,000 words and I probably would be more like 50,000 words in if I didn't get um, interrupted, but it, it's moving pretty fast. Um, yeah. Right. It so you come here according to my business plan that I was working on all day. The audio version should come your way probably the first week in May if you want to pencil it in. Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> That's assuming you still you still want to do audio books. Of course, <laughs> of course I do. Yeah, and so then you're doing book three in the acting out yoga series. Yeah. So the plan now I kind of flipped it. So the the mystery series will hopefully be out. I'm thinking by the end of May, like all three parts of print audio um, and ebook and then I'm gonna guess by December of next year I'm hoping that the meditation book is gonna be out and what's really cool about that is each time I did the the acting out yoga the first two are actually yoga guides and, and that came out of years ago I used to teach kids yoga and I don't have kids I've never been a disciplinarian, so I would, you know, when I was asked to teach them yoga, I thought it would be like teaching adults. And then if you I don't know if you ever saw the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Kindergarten Cop, where he's like, they're pushing me around, where he has to go in and, and like pretend to be an elementary school teacher and the kids are running circles around him. Well, that's what I felt like. And one day I said, well, it's time for silly story time. And everybody got quiet, like, oh, she's going to tell us a story. So I just thought of like, okay, well, you've got the warrior pose, you've got the dancer, so you've got the dragon. Like I was thinking about yoga poses. And so I made up this totally ridiculous story and said, now when I say the character's name, you get into that pose. And so they acted out the whole story. I was like, hmm, huh, this could be something. So the first two books are actually a lesson plan. So you can, you can sit and read with a child, a student, whomever, just for the sake of a fun story, or you can actually do the yoga routine. So I had to make sure that the routine was balanced. So if they do triangle or, or Eiffel Tower, as I called it, triangle on one side, they have to do it on the other. So um, the, the I, you know, I should have had the book before this call, but the left side is kind of like the teacher side and the right side is the story with the illustrations. Um, and so it was meant to be a teaching tool and in every single book, it's a different region. Like the first one was in the Amazon jungle. The second one was in Paris. The third one's going to be in New Mexico. So they can learn about the history and culture of an area. They can learn about the art from that area. Um, there's things about, you know, kindness and just being nice to people. So what's, what's so cool about this third one is this one is not yoga. It's strictly meditation. And I want to address themes like, you know, how kids deal with being angry or being afraid. Um, so it's gonna cover different themes. And the lady I'm working with is one of my oldest friends. We met on our first job at working in a bookstore, go figure. And she now lives in, we, she lived in Pennsylvania. She now lives in New Mexico and she is a clinical musician. So she, she'll go into hospitals and play heart music um, for relaxation to lower their, their blood pressure. Um, she's also an artist and she taught elementary school for like 10, 11 years. So she's like the perfect person to do this. So uh, she does the cover. She did the cover for the mystery. If I didn't care the one what we were just talking about, but I'm actually going to uh, commission her to do all the illustrations. Once I plot out like kind of storyboard how I want it. So, wow, that's quite the, the project there covers everything from education to spirituality to every, it's all in there. Yeah, and, and I'm actually hoping that we'll compose some kind of piece that even if we write the lines in as like musical notes, so if we include even we can probably do a mantra meditation that kids can actually have the music in the book to sing. So it's going to be really, you know, rich as far as talking about the wildlife. And, and I think that the landscape in New Mexico is really interesting. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a and this is the only one that will be audiobook too. The other two, it doesn't make sense because they're lesson plans. They, it just doesn't translate. But this one I could see translating to audio. Yeah. Wow. That would be quite the project. What about other stuff? 
What about others? Like, that's not enough? No, it's nowhere near <laughs> enough. No, not for a workaholic <laughs> like yourself. You know, I got to rethink some. I'm, you know, I was trying to, to slow down. It's just, you know what? It's just that it's fun. You know, when I try to, like, make the time. Well, and you're, you, I, I gather from looking at your Twitter, you seem like you've got a ton of things going on. So I suspect you do have a similar uh, workload. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't do a very good job at lying around, but I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the only other major thing between the last time, well, two things, actually, one of the really cool things I mentioned with, um, masterpiece is I've, it used to be, they'd come to me as a writer and they'd say, well, we want to create this program and here's the topics. Here's what we want you to bring to it. So this is the second time in the last year. Now I'm pitching projects to them and they're saying, okay, you take the lead on it. So I, I, um, got to lead a mindfulness program but it's focused for for older adults and teaching them like the history of meditation but also you know how to use it because serious you know when you're when you're talking to people who are in their their 80s what are you going to tell them that they don't already know so it's 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 bringing kind of a unique perspective and just getting conversations and also inviting them to be part of the process so the next one that I'm doing is, is interesting. I thought it was going to get shot down, but it didn't, um, was for women throughout history and aging. And, and I'm trying to deliver it in a very, uh, delicate way <laughs> because there's a lot between like the 13th and 19th century where the church was basically, you know, as particularly older women, okay, you can't have kids anymore. Um, you're old, you're not attractive to us anymore, your husband died, so now you're a burden to the church because we have to take care of you. Um, you're not allowed to hold down a real job, so we'll just declare you a witch and kill you. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot, it was just, it was so, so uh, um, anyway, but. You say, you, you say that though, like it's, a, like it's a medieval thing, but if you look at, say, televised news, if you look at the presenters of yeah. news almost anywhere in the world on television, you can have an, an old, overweight, balding, you know, late 50s man and he's seen as having some credibility, yet the female co-presenter is, yeah. you know, the opposite of that, shall we say. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, it's... It, there is a use, there seems to be a use by date on female news presenters. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that and you brought the video up in the beginning because as part of the course, and I divided it up by um, young women, there, there's kind of a, a kind of a crone movement where they're trying to embrace the word crone. So original, so, so the course goes, you know, from maiden to the matriarch to crone. And, or, and in that motherhood or matriarch, whether they have kids or not, we talk about how women are viewed in the media and it's horrific. Um, you know, have surgery so that you look young. And then when your surgery sucks, we're going to tell you how awful your plastic surgery is. And it was actually um, Gina Davis who started a foundation because she noticed after age 40, she wasn't getting any roles. And so she actually paid for a study and they found that, you know, there was zero representation of women over 40 in any of the Academy Award winning films. And there was like a four to one ratio of men to women. And men were always like these 50 something year old with like a 19 year old. Yeah. You know, you did, you very rarely had a 50 year old woman who was dating a 30 year old man. Yeah. You know? James so, Bond, probably the classic example of that. You know, you see Sean Connery in, in his last official James Bond film, Diamonds Are Forever, when I don't know what age he was, but he was wearing a wig by then. And, uh, you know, the female co-star, her name is Plenty. And, uh, you know, she's in her 20s. And, and, and the thing is, Julie and I were speaking about this as well. We, we, we kind of go, you know, well, you know, why is that? Why is he not uh, dating an age appropriate woman, first of all? But then the other side of it is like, well, let, are we getting back to being judgy again? If they're happy, you know, who cares? And then I had to say to Julie, I said, yeah, we can say that. But when you see it, it looks creepy because, you know, 
uh, we once went to, it was an owner of a, a co-owner of a radio station I was doing the breakfast show on. He invited us to a Christmas party at a stately home in the UK, which he owned. I mean, this is how rich the guy was. And he was in his 60s and he had his uh, his Filipino girlfriend who was in her 20s. Online. And it was very <laughs> creepy. But then you have to say to yourself, well, look, they seem to be having more fun than all those judgy people on the dance floor there. And who knows, maybe they'll have more fun later yeah. this evening than we will. <laughs> maybe we're being well, judgy in the, in the same, the same I way. I feel like in that case, it's an arrangement. So, you know... Well, if she needs to make some money and send it back to her family in the Philippines, maybe it is. But there's a word for that, isn't there? Yeah, but you go back to like the 13th and 14th century where women are not allowed to be educated or hold down jobs. So the best they could do was marry well. Yeah. That kind of cultural mindset doesn't go away. That no, footballers' goes. wives, I is it? See. In this country, the way they, call them, they call them wags, wives and girlfriends of yeah. people, you know, of the millionaires who play soccer in this yeah. country, the wives and, and girlfriends. Like the, the trophy, yeah, the trophy wife. You know, it's understood that he'll have the money and she looks good. And sometimes it goes in reverse. She'll have the money and he, she'll be with a younger guy because, it, you know. And I guess if you're making that arrangement and it works for you, um, you know. Doesn't how, it get back to your religious thing? of compatible? Yeah, if, it do, if it's not hurting anybody. That's not to say that people don't end up, and even in the book, I mean, Tanager technically is a lot older than Lucene. Yes. He just looks younger because they age differently. Yes. And it would be an interesting thought experiment to do that in reverse and have, like, Lucene be the older one coming back to rescue Tanager and it be a completely inside out, maybe on a parallel world. I wrote it that way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's as easy as somebody's a trophy wife or somebody's the you know the gold digger but i like you i i tend to get judgy when you see that you know and but at the same time then i kind of remember well by cultural standards that's it's just an arrangement like an arranged marriage it's a relate they understand you know as long as i maintain I, there are certain celebrities that had a weight clause for their wives as long as they maintain a certain weight we're good as long as you keep me in the lifestyle, then, you know, if, if that's what a, I think it's sad yes. if that's what a relationship is. Yeah. is but, uh, I mean, it just, it just turns out, you know, when, when women are asked what they, uh, what they want in a partner, the number one thing they usually say is sense of humor, which means that being old, rich, fat, and bald makes you hilarious. <laughs> That's what it means. <laughs> I, don't, I have no words. I'm okay. a writer, but I have no words. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Danielle, it's been great talking to you, and thank you so much for letting me be a part of these this wonderful trilogy of books, The Data Collectors. The first one is called... The first one's The Data Collectors. It's called The Data Collectors. That's why I couldn't think of the name of it. The second one <laughs> is called Breach of Contract. And then the third yeah. one is called Between the Layers because we start Between getting the into... Um, would you call them parallel universes? They're basically different layers of existence, aren't they? They're, 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 they're places where people can go and can get trapped too. I think it could go, you can take it either way. You can take it as a parallel universe. Um, according to shamanism and some other belief systems, there are different levels of reality. You know, like... You Quantum physics who, has that too. Yeah. yeah. So so you'll have people who say they can see ghosts or fairies or sprites and they believe in many different entities. And it might sound crazy, but if it turns out that there are those different levels of reality... Um, yeah, so you can take it either way. You can take it as different layers within our current re reality, or you can look at it as, as parallel worlds. Yeah. Um, Whatever you choose. They are great. They're available as ebooks. <laughs> They're available as audiobooks. And now all three have been co narrated with uh, me as narrator and the male characters, and Danielle Pai, the author, as the female characters. So they are a lot of fun. They're available at Audible. You can get them on iTunes. 
you can get them. There's always three. What's the other one I always... Amazon. Uh, yeah. Amazon. So it's Amazon, iTunes, and Audible. You can get them now. There's a link in the description. Where was my... Uh, there's a link in the description <laughs> where you can get them. I'm pointing at my name. No, I need to point to there. In the description <laughs> below us, if you're watching on YouTube... Uh, there's a link there where you can click on. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial at Audible. You can get them for free uh, if you want to, but uh, they're well worth the money. Daniel Pai, uh, thank you very much for talking to me. Continued success with your your amazing mind that, that comes up with, with not only great characters, but great stories and great situations to put them in. And I don't know if you're planning any more, but long may they continue. They are great. The trilogy is called The Data Collectors. Danielle, thank you so much. Oh, thank you.